Awesome. Well, welcome everybody um, to our webinar for today. My name is Seti Nam and I'll be helping to facilitate this webinar. And yeah, just before we start, I just want to make sure you all can see and hear us okay. So um, I see people joining in from different places, which is awesome. One second. There's a... Great. So we have so many people joining us from different locations, um, and we do want to make sure we're welcoming everyone to the minimum data requirements for crop modeling. Um, if you can see us and hear us okay, please do type in the chat that you can see us and hear us okay, and then we'll get started. Great. I, I see people saying they can see us in here. It's okay. Awesome. So Matthew, I'm going to turn it over to you um, to do a brief introduction of the webinar and then introduce your speakers for today. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> so yeah, I'm Matthew Reynolds. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm leading the community practice in crop modeling for the big data platform. And today we have two talks. And we want to address this naughty issue of minimum data sets. Um, I think that's because there's a, a little bit of a, a little bit of debate about what should be a minimum data set. One thing is for sure, uh, a lot of data is collected in, in crop science and other areas of agriculture. It is not model friendly. Um, and I, we could do a lot more to, to, to generate data sets that can be used in modeling. So we've asked our speakers <clears throat> to address this issue. <clears throat> and of course, um, one, of the, one of the most important networks in modeling is the AgMIP, which Gerrit is a very active member of. So we're, we're honored to have you, Gerrit. Uh, Gerrit. Gerrit's a preeminent scholar in the Institute for Sustainable Food Systems and Professor of Agriculture and Biological Engineering at the University of Florida. Before that, <clears throat> From 2010 to 15, he was director of the Ag Weather Net program and professor of agrometeorology at Washington State University. He has over 25 years of experience in research, and he's also um, the coordinator of the DSAT model, which I think most people would have heard as one of the most popular models um, across the world. And he has a lot of experience in trading. I'll hand it over to you, Garrett, please. If you tell us your ideas on minimum data sets. Okay. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. It's an uh, honor to talk to you a little bit about the minimum data requirement for crop modeling. And what I've done is actually I try to keep it very simple and go back to the beginnings of crop modeling and actually borrowed some material of what we normally use in our um, crop modeling workshops. So first of all, uh, many of you are familiar with crop models, but um, again, I want to try to link uh, crop models very much of ag economic data collection. So traditionally, when we do agricultural research, field research, uh, research in greenhouses, or even pot studies, really what you're trying to do is understand the interaction between the genotype, the crop or the cultivar, the environment, soil and weather, and then management. And we do that through what we call experimental trial and error, where we collect a lot of data. So with crop models, we are really trying to use a similar approach. We're using more a systems um, set of data where we try to combine information from different types of resources. And then ultimately also try to predict yield or other factors we are interested in. 
So first of all, similar to traditional field research, we want to understand the system, the agricultural system, and that by itself is extremely complex. With the models, we want to predict. So we want to predict the yield, we want to predict the number of days to flowering, maturity, and any other factors. And then finally, we want to apply these models to something associated with control and manage, either at a farmer level, at a regional level, or even at a policy level, where we provide recommendations. So ultimately, we feel that with these models, we don't have a final answer, but we're trying to provide options for what we call adaptive management. So these models are very strong once they have been evaluated with local data to evaluate different types of options and responses of a crop or a cultivar to different set of environmental conditions or different set of uh, crop management practices. So many of you might have seen this dime, uh, diagram already. So we see here in the blue boxes, the inputs, and that's what we'll be the discussing a little bit in this seminar. So really with these crop models, we try to separate it into different, two different sets of processes. One is where we're trying to simulate uh, plant growth, starting with photosynthesis, respiration, looking at biomass partitioning, and that is partially then also being controlled by plant development we're trying to predict the number of days to flowering, beginning seed, uh, full seed, physiologic maturity and harvest maturity. And in many of our models, plant development more or less controlled to partitioning and ultimately then we're trying to get to yield. But with these models, we're not only trying to simulate yield, but when we're working with, uh, especially with farmers, we're also interested in, in economics as well, because the farmer might not necessarily be interested in, in highest yield, but he is definitely interested in the highest income. In addition, we can be looking at uh, environmental impact, especially uh, leaching of nitrogen to the groundwater, or looking at resource use with respect to especially irrigation for uh, irrigated production system. So then if you take this diagram and separate it out, we first of all, if you want to run the model, we need to talk about model inputs. So we really, what we see here with three broad categories, which I go back to in detail a little bit uh, later on, we acquire, first of all, weather data, we're going to require soil conditions, and then we need the crop management of what we're trying to simulate. Then the second part is we have the model outputs. So here's where we come into uh, evaluation, where we're trying to compare what the model predicts to some type of observation, either related to, to plant growth, to plant development, uh, to yield, to environmental impacts, such as nitrogen leaching again, or to resource use. So really what we're trying to do with these crop models have a very close link between the experimental data that have been collected in the past, which Mesh already referred to, or maybe even experimental data that have been collected in the future, and use then this type of data to first of all, look at what we state as establishing model credibility, model evaluation to actually show that the model performs well for local type of research question, we might want to use the, the data also for model improvement if we find that the model is insufficient to predict yield or phenology or whatever we're interested in. Or we might want to use the data for model development for a new crop or for a new type of uh, process or response that are currently not incorporated in these models. So one of the challenges we face as crop modelers is that in many cases, depending on the completeness of the experimental data, it's very difficult to obtain a complete set of data from research scientists. In many of these cases also, the research data we feel are underutilized. And in some cases, when a scientist uh, retires, in many cases, his experimental data disappear as well, because they're actually stored in filing cabinets or a computer filing camera might be put in the dumpster and the computer might be disappear as well. So these are some of the, the challenges we face as crop modelers, first of all, trying to get access to the data that had been collected in the past by experimentalists. Luckily, some of the granting agencies are now requiring that data have to be made available at the end of the grant. But again, there's st still challenges in what type of data are being made available and when these data are being made available. 
So then let's get back to the question, what is a minimum data set? So in order to run the model, we need a minimum set of data in order to, to first of all, simulate a process then also compare the outputs. And depending on the models we work with, um, we might require a different set of data. So we've defined a minimum data set, first of all, as a set of data that can be relatively easy collected under field conditions by experimentalists, but at the same time also can provide reasonable answers. And this really is a challenge, but in some cases will require sophisticated equipment for uh, model inputs or for model evaluation that is all of not available. And again, with the more advanced equipment, the more detailed we can conduct our simulations. So this part really we've struggled with over time. And also when we talk to different groups of modelers, um, each person might have a different set of definition for what we def define as minimum data. And again, it also might depend on the type of recursors question we're interested in, but ultimately we as crop modelers in general want to make sure that the data we have allow us to get the right answer for the right reason. So in some cases we've seen that we might be able to predict yield correctly, but for instance, we are not predicting the flowering date or the maturity date correctly. So, and again, that's ultimately not something we're really interested in. So the issue of minimum data set, and apologies here for the typo I just noticed, um, is not new. Uh, what you see here is a publication of a symposium that was held at ICRESET in 1983. So we've been really struggling with the sole issue of minimum data for quite a long time. So in our crop modeling system in general, we try to define three different levels. So first of all, level one is a minimum data set that can be used just to run the model to look at particular application, and, but that doesn't allow us to do any type of model evaluation. Second set of data will allow us to do some type of minimum setting, uh, testing or more expensive setting. And so requires more experimental data. And then level re, uh, three would be a very large set of data, which we can use for model improvement or for model development for cases where no models exist. So with respect to running the crop models, what I showed you in the earlier diagram, we need to weather data, we need a soil characterization, and we need crop management. And I feel that as a agricultural scientist in general, looking at ag agricultural system, this type of data should be available for any type of experiment if we're truly interested in understanding the genotype by environment, by management interaction. So even if we're conducting an irrigation experiment, soil data should be available and where the data should be available. So to me, this is not necessarily a requirement of crop modeling only, but also a requirement from very, for very robust experimental data collection. So then when we look at the weather data inputs, uh, we will require all crop models, the daily maximum and minimum temperature, and daily total precipitation or rainfall. And in most cases, these are quite easily to obtain. We require daily total solaration, solar radiation because we're uh, simulating photosynthesis and we all realize that without having solar radiation, we cannot predict photosynthesis and thus we cannot predict uh, yield at the end. And again, for some cases, solar radiation is a challenge, but we found other alternatives, say currently from uh, satellite data, using that as a substitute when the solar radiation is not available uh, from a local weather station. The second set of data then would be soil characteristics. We need to have some information about um, the soil surface. We need to know the slope because we're trying to simulate runoff. We need to know the soil color because we're trying to um, calculate soil reflectance. We need to know a little bit about soil permeability related to infiltration and also about drainage because that is again uh, linked to leaching of nitrogen to the groundwater. Now, when we're simulating a one-dimensional soil profile, which most of our crop models are able to simulate, we need to have some information about the soil profile. So we're looking at um, soil texture and bulk density for each individual uh, soil horizon. And then we can use Peter transfer functions to calculate a permanent wilting point and a field capacity to really do a detailed uh, simulation of the soil water balance. Organic matter and nitrogen also become important when we're trying to simulate um, a soil nitrogen balance. 
And then with respect to crop management, um, we do need to know the crop, of course. We need to know the local cultivar, the variety, the hybrid or the clone we're working with, planning date or transplanting date, uh, spacing information, irrigation, both the date and the amount of the irrigation, especially if we're looking at uh, the response of water to the system. And in some cases, again, that information is challenging looking at past experimental data. We need to also know if we're looking at a uh, response to fertilizer, the dates and the amounts of the type of fertilizer that were, were applied, either inorganic or organic. And in some cases, you might be interested in other chemical applications or operations such as tillage or harvest. So basically, this is the three sets of types of data required to run the crop model, though it doesn't allow us to do any type of model evaluation. So then if we move on to the level two type of data, we need to have some type of crop manage, uh, measurements. So the minimum of the minimum would be really yield, but um, as we know, it's very difficult to only predict yield without having any other information. So it would be nice if we also had the yield components, looking at uh, the number of grains and seeds and grain size. Biomass at harvest would also be uh, preferable, so we can calculate the harvest index and look at biomass partitioning. And for us, the dates of the critical events, especially the flowering date and the physiological maturity date, are also very critical as well, because uh, normally we state in our workshops, again, that if we're unable to predict phenology correctly, we are unable to predict uh, yield. And then this is where the challenge come in with respect to additional data. And as uh, in many cases, uh, we are models are accused really that require too much data, but I want to bring it back to the research question. So if we're interested in trying to simulate growth and partitioning, then in some cases we need to have some additional data associated with what we call growth analysis, where we uh, ob obtain measurement during the growing season, either leaf area index or looking at leaf weight, stem weight and reproductive weight to help us evaluate if the partitioning is being done correctly uh, by the crop model. If we're interested in some other processes, we might want to measure photosynthesis. Again, if we truly uh, want to evaluate how our models predict photosynthesis. If we're looking at a detailed energy balance, then maybe we want to measure canopy temperature. And there might be many other processes we want to simulate, and thus we need to take the appropriate measurements associated with that. And that's where I've shown them here in square brackets. They're optional, and they're laid back to the, the research question. You're really interested in a uh, response of uh, water inputs to our crop model, then maybe we need to take some additional measurements related to soil moisture, preferably at different depths and over time. In most cases, this requires a little bit more expensive equipment, which people might not have access to. But again, if we want to make sure that our model simulates a uh, response to water correctly, we need to have that information available. If we're interested in fertilizer response, maybe we want to take some measurements associated with soil nitrogen, soil phosphorus or soil carbon in the process. Again, at different depths, preferably at least at the beginning of the growing season and at harvest to get us a little bit of an idea of what's happening to and those processes in the soils as well. And then if we want to move on to more detailed response, what I then call enhanced understanding, uh, for instance, if we're interested in climate change, we know that our models do a fairly good job in responding to CO2 and temperature, but in some cases we feel that additional advancements are needed. So in that case, you might uh, obtain data from uh, three air CO2 en um, enrichment experiments, what we call phase or even T phase. Um, if we're interested in simulating service ozone response, which in many cases our models currently cannot handle. Again, we need to take additional measurements, um, Asian route clouds or other air pollutants. Many of our models uh, don't respond to that, so we do need to collect data to address those research questions. Similarly, looking at soil factors, uh, many of our models don't really respond to salinity, soil acidity, aluminum toxicity, etc. And again, we need to then collect additional data to help us improve our crop model to, uh, to take those measurements so we can actually simulate those processes. 
And then finally, uh, one of the challenges we currently uh, really face within crop modeling is the uh, interaction with pests and diseases, which in many cases could be crop specific, could be pests and disease specific as well, could be region spe specific. So if we want to simulate that, we need to collect additional data to help understand those processes and develop the underlying equations and bring those into our crop models. Many of our crop models also cannot handle many of the horticultural crops. We currently don't deal very well with tree fruit crops or underutilized crops. So again, if we want to simulate those, we need to collect additional data to develop those new models. Uh, another aspect becoming quite popular in the crop modeling community is looking at nutritional quality. Uh, some of our models can deal with prote proteins, but only to a limited extent. So again, if we want to simulate that, we need to have some ad um, advanced measurements um, to deal with those processes. So then to summarize, to go back to data collection, we know that when you conduct an experiment, again, we're looking at a G by E by M, we have an hypothesis, we have a research question. And again, from a systems approach, we should have a complete set of data to help define those research questions. That same type of data can also be used in crop modeling. And again, if the weather data, the soil data and the management available, they can be used to help us address then the model uh, application question to first of all, maybe calibrate a model, evaluate a model, and then look at a, a model improvement as well for some of the process we currently cannot simulate. So then to, to summarize really, what we really need is the input data to run the model. It doesn't allow us to do the evaluation. And then in order of priority here, Again, depending on what we have access to, we definitely need yield as a number one priority. We'd like to have phenology. If that's limiting, the, the first one we'd like to have access to would be maturity date. We also like to have flowering date. Um, after that, we would prefer the yield components and then find a biomass or the harvest index. And then the other observation depend really on our research goals and objectives of our modeling study. So then to, to summarize what we see in, in our crop modeling community in general, without really assessing any type of um, quality to the, the experimental data itself, you really require a level one to conduct a simulation, level two, a minimum set of data for model evaluation and calibration, and a level three, a set of data that allows us to do uh, further model development and model improvement. So with that, I'll be glad to answer questions, but I think the, the questions will be delayed to um, after the second presentation. So thank you for your interest in, in data and crop modeling. Awesome, thank you so much for your presentation, Dr. Garrett. Um, so yeah, I'll turn it over to Matthew to introduce the second speaker. Oh, uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm happy to say that I'm sitting here right next to Tom. Um, since he's based here at Simit. He's actually the presently the enterprise breeding system product manager and excellence in breeding enterprise architect which many of you may not know what that means, but the Excellence in Breeding platform is designed to essentially bring the breeding programs of the CG system up to a certain minimum standard um, in order to improve efficiency and genetic gains. So in this role, he's responsible for de developing um, a breeding an enterprise breeding information system. Before that, he was the research information architect at Data Science and Informatics DuPont Pioneer, where he was responsible for phenotyping, conducting precision phenotyping and analysis, crop growth, modeling research, and developing uh, protocols for IT. He consulted with data scientists on applying breeding trial results to on farm yield uh, response classification. He was advising trade research scientists on effective experimental design and execution. He was consulting with breeding, agronomy and sales organizations. 
to define predictive uh, agricultural visualization requirements and many other activities, too many to read here. <laughs> um, obviously a very experienced guy. So thank you, Tom, for agreeing to give us this talk. Sure, let me see if I can share here. Can people see this? Yes, we can see the presenter view of the video. Okay, so uh, as Matthew mentioned that um, excellence in breeding is you know, working to the term we use is modernized breeding programs, really how you uh, better deliver genetic gain. Ultimately, it's that bag of seeds plus the G by E by M understandings you need to give to a farmer for them to make the appropriate choices as to what varieties to plant and how to plant them for their circumstances, whether it's their own consumption or they're aiming at a market, you know, there's obviously different considerations there. So a key part of this is, is what is your product profile? What characteristics, again, it's not just yield, there's many characteristics, both genetic, sociological, whatever, that, that, of that product that that farmer wants to breed and deliver. And what then are, you know, so that product profile, those concepts of target product environment, but also what is the schema or methodology or approach that a breeding organization is going to take to get there? And so that's what we're trying to capture in the slide. Of course, there's you know, pre-breeding. I don't like that word, but that seems to be used a lot where that's really where you're identifying genetic potential. Uh, you know, core breeding where you're saying these varieties we think demonstrate that potential and then final validation, which is really in the circumstances directly faced by farmers, is it really gonna work? Um, so another key goal is continuous improvement, you know, that if there's poor high air, there's gonna be poor predictability and therefore it's gonna take away a lot of the efforts that we're working to, to accomplish. You know, so how do we capture this information, you know, uh, and use that to understand where the error is, you know, costs are, inefficiencies, whatnot. I mean, ultimately to becoming predictable in the sense that transition from breeding is just about the results of a trial to that is a sampling of that uh, response surface of G by E by M and how we you know, then use the trial information to build predictive models to, to, to project into the future. And this just happens to be uh, across the bottom here, uh, a drought uh, stress concept, yield, and just trying to predict the, uh, the uh, behavior of key hybrids uh, in this continuum and a pro provide actionable information. This is a breeder equation here. Well, you know, if I'm here and I need to be here, where do I, how do I change my germplasm? If I'm a, uh, um, you know, agronomist or a seed systems person, you know, what's the trade-offs between different uh, potentialities? And if I'm a farmer, what in my particular set of environments, what will be the types of germplasm that would be available there? Uh, so this project, uh, we've agreed that we're starting with cement maize, wheat, yearly rice. Uh, and this year, just a very small group of breeders to stand up this system. But then in 2020, a more systematic adoption, and realistically that's going to take two years at a minimum, um, with some maize, wheat, eerie rice. But then in 2020, you know, who's the next group of individuals? So in 2020, you have to start that planning so that that initial adoption uh, starts with them and uh, uh, you know, in the following year, and in, you know, just go down that progression. And I uh, know that, for instance, in the Erie Rice and the Senate Maize and Wheat Renewal Grants, you know, specifically who these people are and things like that's been identified. Um, uh, you know, so anyway, this year it's just, what are the core abilities of conducting breeding? You know, create experiments, whether it's a trial or nursery, you know, seed inventory, you know, the, the work of getting those trial arrays to the field, you know, for your mapping, planting, data collection, uh, management practices, uh, starting with uh, scaled analytics, with 
phenotypic estimated breeding values, um, uh, connection to uh, sampling for connection to analytical labs. There's always data migration, uh, decision support. You know, those are the basic things. Um, and uh, you know, we're very much using what's called an architected strategy. You know, that's where you know you ask people what they're trying to do, model it in terms of workflows and data, and then ask, well, what are the right IT artifacts to solve this problem? Uh, and so that's led to this very high level architecture diagram where these are based on what people do. These are in some sense, functional modules uh, of IT that have the capacity or capability of uh, doing those types of activities. And so it's very important to have, you know, you want to not replicate functionality that is best concentrated. You know, you want to be modular so that you can react to change, add new things. Uh, you know, so there's a variety of uh, design uh, practices that a more formal system or a system that's going to scale to the breadth and depth and scope of operations that it takes to modernize breeding and to do the type of work you know, we're talking about here. And for um, you know, a couple of things in terms of minimum data requirements, I mean, this is where you create the experiments that go to the field. You know, specifically identified, I'll say those arrays of germplasm, plot concept, place concept, whatnot. And, and that's then a foundation. The other key part of your core breeding system is your seed inventory. You know, how much do you have? Their, their genetic con con concepts, whatnot. And so then once you have these two key things, and of course, you can implement them in different ways. You can collect data in different ways, but also what we call a concept of a, of a container where we build to this edge so that the information, for instance, that Matthews drones need that to accurately attribute images and feed trait data back to those arrays, we can provide that information, but we're not going to build the image processing pipeline. It gives them something you can plug into uh, to do that. In the same way, we talked about you know, collecting soil information, weather information, things like that. Again, we'll build to that edge so those devices uh, that need that, you know, to uh, the information those devices need to collect that information they have it and they can give it back to us you know by that way so there's some elements of this that we will build and there's some elements we'll build to these edges and it's up to uh teams you know that we work with to uh you know to uh build things within these boxes of course since the data is here getting to that continuous improvement you know, that in my experience has been, as we pointed out today, where is the data? You know, what is it? <laughs> you know, it's all irregular. Well, we can provide, since the operations are happening through the system, we can provide that data in a structured, organized way. I mean, we're not necessarily going to build that software that's necessary for research and development, uh, but we can provide the data to it so that it very much scales that way. And so, and again, we're not going to do the on-farm thing, but again, we can capture defined outputs of that, getting back to the initial you know, product uh, profile, target product environment concept. Uh, and as an example of how this comes into uh, modeling, I mean, this is an example of how, uh, you know, we're thinking, you know, I've done it once before and thinking of doing it. You know, so you have different repositories, you know, your trial data, the germplasm data, the uh, what we would call a trait or response measurement of some type, your field data, you know, your uh, like your farm management data, soil data, weather data. So you don't try to put all these things in one database. Each type of database has its own appropriate data model, uh, technical implementation. You can add to these, you know, things as as time progresses. So it's a, it's an adaptable system, uh, but then. You know, and also there's different operations on data. I mean, we all started with what we call uh, you know, the response measurements that represented the values for model equations. You know, we of course had experiments to measure those for varieties that were interested in modeling. And of course, the starting point would be a phenotypic analysis of that. So you have 
flexible ways of obtaining data for a given operation. You don't try to put all this into one means of doing wow. it. And of course, outputs from something can be captured back and become inputs into others. You know, we did machine learning uh, uh, to fit from the outputs of phenotypic analysis fit what we thought was the optimum parameter value uh, for uh, a crop model input. And then of course the modeling proper and then of course appropriate visualization. Uh, how does this look technically? I mean, there are these core things we're creating, you know, the core breeding, experiment creation, whatnot, ability to do sampling, ability to do field things, ability to manage your analyses. And then there's services such as well, who you are and things like that. But also it's, ex you know, that there is a service layer through APIs that connect parts of the system that we're building, but others can connect to it, uh, in case, you know, to take advantage of these system uh, potentialities. Um, you know, a big part of that is uh, modeling. You know, you know, to do this, we have to appropriately define, well, what is a seed? <laughs> and it's a genome, but there's different dimensions of information, you know, from a gene bank perspective, uh, legal regulatory, uh, you know, pedigree or genealogy, uh, things like that. And of course, these relationships can be quite complex and there's a difference between data collected and through an analysis, how you declare a phenotype or uh, stable behavior in the same way of genotyping. Uh, you know, so, so modeling is very important to this and there's a formal methodology to this. And, and, uh, and ultimately, uh, you know, that models are able to generate code. So we can actually generate code from models. And so again, that gets back to this architecture strategy that it takes effort to get this going, but in the end of the day, it's much more efficient than not doing it this way. Um, you know, that it takes uh, it's a little bit of a science here. It takes a strategy where, um, and of course you have your primary yield trials or breeding trials, and that's the majority, but you need to have, you don't try to collect all data from everything. Uh, you know, you have, uh, you know, for maize, we call them testers, you know, or checks, you know, that you need to be regularly evaluating your checks so, so that you know you have that continuous G by N and behavior across all your target product environments over years. You have your again your breeding trials, but then you have specialized trials that are really designed and more formally tease out these types of interactions and allow the level two data you mentioned earlier on, you know, it would be captured in these trials. And then of course where you identify, uh, I'll set you mentioned a yield component and uh, physiological components. You know, specialized uh, assays that once you've validated that, uh, you know, this response measurement actually represents that, then you can very much scale it up and, and do a lot of high throughput uh, phenotyping of that. So, but again, the IT, it just doesn't make any difference. It's just a, an experiment to the IT. And so part of this is that we need to define with you what are these were operational workflows. You know, what are the procedures? What are the methodologies? Those are formalisms in terms of data models and therefore software logic. And uh, you know, so that's a key part of that. And, uh, and just to see, you know, genotyping, let me skip over to this one. I mean, field behaviors is, is uh, you know, how does it work? Well, you create your experiment here. It comes to the software we're creating to do this mapping, uh, whatnot, but then you enable uh, from that mapped array, you can provide information to your high throughput phenotyping or your combines, handheld devices, you know, planters. Uh, you know, so we're, you know, so we're through this modular approach, we're saying, well, what is essential to execute at scale? But then there's places where there's going to be a lot of heterogeneity. But again, we can give them that necessary information so that they have what they need to operate efficiently, but in turn, they can give us back. Uh, and again, what we do is we build to these edges here um, and it's up to then uh, a breeding program to decide, well, you know, how do you want to do this? We've given you connectors, so to speak, to plug to, but, you know, this is then the work of that, of that effort. Um, you know, target products environments are, are very important. Again, there's lots of header, uh, different types of data and concepts. But also, um, you know, there's different scales here. You know, there's the 
local scale where you sampled or have a value of that trial, but then you have more regional data, say from satellites and, and things like that. You know, so, so how you collect data, manage data, integrate data, interpolate data across these different scales. Uh, you know, in leading, I'll skip over some of this. Um, so modeling is very important, you know, so these are the high level domains of the model and it enables types of different types of data integration and operations. And part of the reason we're doing this is that we, again, we need to be modular and you don't want to solve everything all at one time. And, and you may get to where, uh, you know, say for your concept of geographic place, good enough for today, but if it's isolated, you can scale it up uh, in the future. And so how does this look a little more uh, you know, complex where you have uh, you know, these, these uh, geographic uh, you know, concepts, well, you separate out the con concept of place and, and uh, they're just uh, units and they can be grouped by larger units, but also have attributes uh, defining them. And so it's a very generic, scalable thing. What is data? Well, it's just a sample of, of it's just a sample of something. So you formally separate the act of collecting primary data from how you process it to deliver, you know, response measurements. Um, and again, you know, so so that's a key. Uh, and I'm not going to go all the details here, but but you know that having appropriate models very much allows us to um, do this type of work in a very generic, create generic software uh, that's very scalable, extendable. And, you know, you separate out, um, you know, just different concepts And this, you know, again, I won't go into all this in great detail, but uh, you know, from my prior experience, you know, this, this is very important. Another thing that's very important is that, you know, getting back to, uh, you know, these product profiles and target product environments or you know, breeding zones that, that, that they are sampling of, you know, that things bounce around a lot. You know, so what's really the right answer? <laughs> uh, it's, it's challenging. Uh, and so that leads to various types of gaps between what the breeders thought they were delivering and what actually happens. Um, you know, so analytics is very important. And, and so, to me, part of the reason we're having that rigor of, uh, say, trial design and inventory and response measurement and other types of data collections is to enable analytics so we can programmatically fit that data together into appropriate analysis arrays and just feed it there. And so, you know, again, you have your primary data, how it becomes ready in the context of analysis. There's different high level domains of analysis, you know, primary results can feed back. Uh, ways to summarize data for, um, uh, um, you know, visualization, decision support. So again, this year we're starting on on this one uh, here. Uh, is it not wanting to go forward? Um, and so, how do we do that? Well, you have the concept of a request, where which identifies a what data I need, uh, b for the objective of the analysis, what statistical model I need, and therefore how to prepare that data. And then of course we can, you know, we can provide access to uh, compute resources, capture the output, have primary results which can feed back as inputs or go into reporting. And so again, this is just a very uh, scalable strategy. I personally have done this where I've made over 8,000 of these uh, Someone said I should use the word red cards. <laughs> but anyway, it's a very scalable thing. And we do have a small little pilot on how we're doing this with the crop model. Um, and of course, from primary phenotypic analysis, you, you capture many kinds of results. Here is the uh, covariance various correlation matrix that is key to defining the response across your environments or management scenarios by uh, environment conditions, uh, by genetics. So this captures, or this is the ground truth of your G by E by M. And, and this then, in my opinion, is a starting point for everything else you want to do. Uh, it doesn't necessarily explain it, but if you can't recapitulate this, then you know your model's not working. Um, of course, we're capturing 
uh, data you know, in a very highly multidimensional fashion. Uh, and, and so you know, these, are, you know, these are your fitness landscapes, different natures. And, and in a standard visualization, such as yield by evapotranspiration, uh, is, is just a projection from that. Um, and, and so you can then connect these to very, many different types of decision support visualizations, uh, like an example here. So anyway, that, that's where I'll, I'll stop. Right now. So I think I'm supposed to talk a little bit about, um, anyway, focusing on this is how we proceed to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, great. Thank you so much, um, Tom, for that presentation. We do have a number of questions that have been rolling in from different people. Um, so we can either, Matthew, we can either tackle now or go into your section. No, let, let's, how, how long do you think we have? Um, we, have about, we have about 10 minutes left. Let's have some quick questions and then I'll just uh, make a final comment, then. yes. Okay, awesome, great. Um, so I will start with um, Dr. Garrett um, for some of the questions that we have that have come in. So somebody asked, um, is there a chance to include observed data from satellites, example, LAI into the model? Um, we have had a question multiple times and normally what I tell people, we, yes, we can use satellite data for model evaluation but I don't feel that it is appropriate to use uh, satellite data as ingestion into the crop model and replace the simulated LAI. The reason is that if we update um, the LAI in the model, then we also need to update um, the other biomass components and soil components as well, which becomes a, a real challenge. So we prefer to use satellite data to improve the calibration or model evaluation and keep it external to the crop model. Okay, awesome. Thank you. That's, that's very helpful to know. Um, and this is a question for um, Dr. Tom. There's a question that says, um, Ruth from Togo wants to know, how can I simulate maize grain yields limited by water, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium? Well, you know, it, you, you just take it apart into the pieces, you know, that if you have uh, a, a trial where that's, where those treatments, where those are designed treatments of that trial, then you're measuring the behavior of your germplasm by those treatments and you're, and you're measuring different response measurements, such as grain yield, you know, flowering time, whatever you think is appropriate to measure by those treatment structures of your trial. But also treatments can be both within trials, such as I have, say, a blocking structure with different fertilizer levels, but also in the concept of multi-location trials, each location is in effect a treatment or replication. And so you bring that in that way. Uh, and of course, you have classification of your environments. It could be that this is a uh, you know, low nitrogen environment or this was a drought stress environment. So you can bring it in both as a formal within trial treatment through the sampling of your environment, through your multi-location concepts, and you have classification of those places. Uh, and so that's the starting point to understand the behavior of germplasm by those E and M uh, considerations. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much for clarifying that. Um, and then one of these questions that we have coming in from Clement, um, which can probably be tackled by either speaker. It says, could you provide any comments on the minimum years data, um, on the minimum years data needs for crop model calibration or validation? The question again, could you provide any comments on the minimum years data needed for crop model collab, collab, calibration or validation? Well, let me just make, I'll make a comment, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. not an inclusive comment. Uh, you know, one key strategy of that is, of course, what they, you know, identifying the data you should collect and collecting it accurately. <laughs> you know, so if you, if, you have, if you don't have necessary information or it's full of error, then of course your models will be off. Uh, another, but another, aside from just basic uh, execution, um, is identifying appropriate performance checks and regularly collecting data on them. 
Because if your models for a given year or situation cannot accurately predict the behavior of your checks, then you know something is really wrong. And so that's a quick way to keep things on track. <clears throat> Awesome. Um, let me respond to that as well. So I don't really want to uh, express it in number of years. I like to express it in number of environments. And we really want to look at, at different environments. So different environments could be different location, could be different planting date, or could be different year. So the minimum of the minimum would be, we can do it for one year, but um, we state that then if we calibrate a model the outcome of the parameters uh, for which you calibrate the model with will not be very robust. If we then try to evaluate a model for, for a different location, different environment, there's a high likelihood that the model will not be accurate. So we prefer to state that we need at least uh, a minimum of, of, of two environments, preferably even maybe three environments. But again, it all depends also how much data you have available. Mm, awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, we do still have a number of questions coming in. Um, I do want to mention that we might not be able to get to all the questions, but we do appreciate participants for sharing those questions with us. So um, one of the other questions is coming from um, Jayati, apologies if I mispronounced your name, but it's saying, how can I compute ir the irrigation requirement of a crop using the DSSAT? Um, so most um, crop models allows us to put in a irrigation as an input. So in DSAT specifically, we have something called automatic irrigation management that allows us to set a, a threshold and the model calculates uh, the available water. And if the available water has um, reached that threshold value, then in the model we irrigate. So then that allows us to see uh, as a function of threshold value, how much uh, water will be required and then we can also look at the yield simulated by the model as well so we can look at a water by yield response curve but i mean that's a very decent specific question not necessarily related to to minimum data mm, yeah definitely we do have a lot of specific questions coming in yeah, um, i think i think that sorry it's interrupting the decent specific question maybe uh, if people can just send me an email i'll be glad mm -hmm. to respond uh, personally Okay, that's helpful um, because, yeah, I do want to mention that we will be able to tackle any follow-up questions um, via email. Uh, Matthew, I'm going to turn it over to you um, to kind of give us a big picture, give us a summarizer, and then continue from there. Okay, well, just briefly, thanks uh, to Gary and Tom for those talks. I'm sure there will be follow-up. Um, in terms of minimum data set, obviously, that I think that's something that that the big data community, agmit community, we'd all like to see clearer definitions of, of minimum data set. I think Garrett gave a, a good, a great example. Um, I'd just like to use the, the my prerogative of having the last word to make a somewhat prerogative, perhaps a, um, I don't know, a state, a, a, oh, to make a statement that may be provocative. Um, but I wonder in the era of high throughput phenotyping, that some of the more labor intensive measurements that Gerrit described could be substituted um, for the, the, essentially what is a bioassay, or not necessarily sometimes in some cases substituted, but also augmented. And, and, and to give examples, can we use, instead of, I think a lot of people are not, if I think of many of the collaborators we work with in the CG, they're not set up to collect nitrogen at different soil profiles, but they could be collecting NDVI data, which can give us a proxy for the same. Similarly, they can be collecting water index data it can be indicative of, of the amount of water that's in the soil. And actually in this case, accessible to the plant, because it's always very difficult to know that just from soil sampling. Canopy temperature can be used perhaps instead of air temperature to give an even more accurate estimate of the, of the, of the thermal conditions that are driving growth. And uh, ground cover indices can be used to estimate light interception. So I think that we, we need to incorporate, in my opinion, some of the high throughput phenotyping opportunities we have 
to augment or rethink the minimum data set. On that note, and that obviously opens up a huge debate, but uh, maybe for the next webinar. So thank you everyone for, for attending and uh, let's keep this topic moving forward. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, thanks everybody for attending. Um, what's the best way to connect with you all offline for any follow-up questions? That's a final question that has come up. Um, I think I'm gonna ask Annabelle to answer that question. If she on mute. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, so I will send here uh, my email address or yeah, and then you can send all the questions to my email and we will do a selection and we will send the questions to Gary, Tom and Matthew accordingly. Awesome, great. So we will share that email with people so that they can connect with all of us um, and ask any questions after the webinar. So again, thank you all so much for tuning in. Apologies for um, the technical difficulties in the beginning um, and looking forward to having you all join us on the next webinar. Thank you for sending.